Setting up your workspaces and controlling access to Microsoft Fabric is one of the most important factors to get right when you're transitioning from the world of Power BI to the world of Fabric. And it's something that I see people make a lot of mistakes in. They rush in, they set up their environment very quickly, and then they spend a lot of time trying to make it work for them. And this can cost a lot of money and it can lose business confidence when you're migrating. And there's lots of things that can go wrong here. So probably a better approach is just to take a step back, try and understand what some of the most common mistakes that people make are, understand the best practices, understand some of the limitations of some of the tools in Fabric that we need to bear in mind when we're creating a strategy for setting up our Fabric environment. So in this video, I'm gonna walk through what I think are seven of the most common mistakes that I see people making when they're setting up a new fabric environment and how you can avoid these mistakes. And this video is part two in a nine part series that I'm doing on this channel, really to help you transition from the world of Power BI to the world of Microsoft Fabric. So if that's a journey that you're going on or you're about to go on in the future, then make sure you subscribe to the channel because there'll be lots more videos coming very shortly. Let's jump into it. The general structure of a fabric environment can be drawn like this in a bit of a hierarchy. And in this video, we'll be looking at capacities, workspaces, and items within workspaces, and how to set up each of these for success. And normally there'll be one tenant per organization, although some can have multiple tenants, but most organizations will have just one. And in that tenant, you can provision one or more capacities. And a capacity is a distinct pool of resources allocated to Microsoft Fabric or to Power BI in the case of a Power BI capacity. And you can purchase pay-as-you-go fabric capacities in the Microsoft Azure portal. But how many capacities will you need as an organization? This is one of the first big decisions that you're gonna make when entering the world of fabric. And it's where a lot of companies make their first mistake, which is provisioning too many or too few capacities for their requirements. So how many capacities should you purchase? Well, in an ideal world, you'd only need one capacity. So that's much easier to manage, a lot less administration that needs to be done. But there's a few common situations that mean that you might have to buy and maintain multiple capacities. The first one being to comply with data residency regulations, such as GDPR, that state that you have to store and process data within a specific geography. So in Fabric, when you provision a capacity, you do so in a specific region of the world which defines where the data is stored. So to comply with these regulations, you'll need different capacities in different regions. Reason two is to align with existing organizational cost centers. So in some organizations, billing and budgets are managed through cost centers, which might align to specific departments within an organization. So you might have an IT cost center, marketing cost center, and they might want to create one capacity for each cost center to make billing easier to align it with existing profit and loss cost centers. And it makes it easier to attribute what's being used in Fabric by which department. Reason three is that you might want to split capacities based on the type of workload. So a capacity has a set amount of resource. And if either your data processing is very intensive, so you've got a lot of data engineering, or you're doing lots of machine learning training, for example, or you've got a lot of existing Power BI reports that have quite a a stringent refresh schedule, lots of read operations, and you want to make sure that your Power BI consumers are getting a good experience, then you might want to split these kind of workloads out into different capacities. Moving on to number two, and in a capacity, you can have more than one workspace. So now we're going to be talking about workspaces. And a workspace is a place you can create fabric items like a data warehouse, a data pipeline, and generally collaborate with your colleagues on new data infrastructure and data projects. Now at the workspace level, this is also the main way we can give access to people or groups in Fabric. But again, how many workspaces do you need? That can be quite a complex question to answer and there's a ton of different strategies for workspaces. So you might have different workspaces for different departments, if you're working towards more of a data mesh architecture, or you could have different workspaces for different layers in a medallion architecture, for example. Plus, you might have duplications of each workspace for development, testing, production. You can quickly see how the number of workspaces can quickly add up if you're not intentional 
with your workspace design. Now, a common mistake I see is organizations designing too many workspaces. And it's difficult to say how many is too many because every organization is different. But if you're suffering from any of the following, you probably have too many. So data is stored across so many different workspaces that it's difficult to communicate and understand the end-to-end -end data processing workflow in your organization or if the administration of these workspaces becomes an unmanageable burden, or if the user experience is really poor and people are being granted to hundreds of workspace and they can't make sense of what's happening where, it's impossible to find the fabric items that you need. So what can you do to reduce the number of workspaces? Well, three things for starters. One idea is to align your workspaces to personas in your data team. For example, creating a workspace specifically for data engineering items, then we can add data engineers, that persona into this workspace to take ownership of these items. Similarly, you might have a data science workspace that contains all of your data science items. And again, the data science teams are the main kind of owners of that workspace. Secondly, a good way of reducing the number of workspaces you provision is to name your fabric items using a naming convention. Now you could leverage this strategy for differentiating between dev, test, and prod data warehouses, for example, in the same workspace, removing the need to have three times the number of workspaces for dev, test, and prod workloads. And thirdly, it's important to understand the difference between workspace level sharing and item level sharing. And we can use these two in combination to try and cut down on the number of workspaces you need. For example, you might not need a separate workspace just to host the gold layer of a medallion architecture, for example. And that could be a data warehouse that you're surfacing for people using Power BI. Instead, if we understand about item level sharing, we can see that there is actually an option for sharing data sets just for consumption of Power BI reports, for example. And we'll go into item level sharing in more detail later. Next up, we've got an absolute classic. It was around in the Power BI days and it's just as relevant today in Fabric. Now we've all got that email or Teams message from someone saying, oh, I've just joined the data engineering team, for example, please can you add me into the data warehouse? So either you share the data warehouse or the workspace in general with that user. Can you spot the problem? Yeah. So if you're adding individuals to a workspace or sharing a specific fabric item with an individual, things get really complicated and difficult to manage quite quickly. Now, a much better solution is to create either Entra ID security groups or Microsoft 365 groups, both of which you can do in the Azure portal under Entra ID. Then you can give access to the group to the workspace or the individual items. So you're only ever sharing stuff with groups. And then when a new person joins, you can just add the person into the group rather than sharing the individual items and the workspace with that individual. And if you want to do a bit of spring cleaning of your workspaces to try and understand where individuals have been added to groups, you can either do that through the UI using Manage Access, or you can also do it via the API using these endpoints here. So you created some groups and you want to add a group to a workspace. You'll notice that at the workspace level, there are four roles you can assign. Now, a key mistake that people make here is not fully understanding what each role means in general, but also what each role means for specific item types in your workspace. So what can a viewer do with a data warehouse, for example? If you review the documentation, you'll find this quite helpful chart that shows four roles, admin, member, contributor, and viewer. Then down the page, they list a number of actions that the user or group can take with that role. Now, whilst this visualization is okay, I think it's still pretty difficult to interpret. So instead, what I've done is I've taken the same information, but I've split it down to make it much more explicit for each fabric item. Now, some of them I have grouped if they have exactly the same permissions profile, and we'll explore that in a bit more detail. But when we visualize it like this, I think it makes it a lot more easy to understand what each role can do with each fabric item. So here are some of the key points to understand. I've actually split it out into two tables. One is for workspace administration type duties. And for these, each of the four roles can do slightly different things. So that's important to note. But for all the fabric item related stuff, so all the stuff related to data pipelines, related to data warehouse, all the fabric item stuff, 
as I would call it, you'll notice that the permissions for admin member and contributor are all the same, which is why I've grouped them. And in general, a viewer in a workspace can only view contents of stuff, right? So for example, they can read a notebook, but they can't execute it. Now, the exception to this rule is the data pipeline, where a data can actually execute and cancel the execution of a data pipeline. And this is one of the only things that a viewer can do over and above viewing stuff. And the other thing to note about the viewer role is that they can only access the SQL endpoint of a lake house. They can't access a lake house through Spark because they can't execute any code in the Spark environment or through any other methods, right? So they can't use the TDS endpoint, any sort of APIs. They can't do any of that. They can only use the SQL endpoint. And we'll see why that might be a bit later on. Now, in the last section, we were talking explicitly about workspace level sharing, i.e giving people or groups access to the workspace and therefore everything in the workspace. However, we can also share fabric items individually without having to share the whole workspace. But this is where a common mistake is again often made because not all fabric items can be shared individually. And I think this is something that's not widely understood. The data pipeline, the data flow and the event stream cannot be shared individually at the time of this recording. And the only real option at the moment to give people access to these is to give people access to the whole workspace which contains these items. So that's something to bear in mind when you're planning out your strategy. Let's take a quick look at the options for individual item sharing. So for the items that you can share, let's look at how they differ. Oh, and to share an item, you just right click on it when you're in like a workspace view, click on share. And then you get this menu item and you see the options for the permissions that you'd like to share. And you can select with whom, hopefully a group that you want to share that item with. And for each item, you get a different set of options. And I've copied them here for you to take a look at, right? So each of them is slightly different. So just bear that in mind, depending on the item that you're sharing, you get a slightly different set of options to choose from. So that's item level sharing, but we can also go to a more granular level if need be. In the data warehouse and the SQL endpoint of the lake house, we can get even more fine-tuned access using any of these features. So object level sharing, which is sharing tables and views. So not the whole data warehouse, but an individual table and an individual view with a particular user. Column level security, row level security, dynamic data masking. Now how to do all of these things is beyond the scope of this video, but just know that it's possible. And if you want to do that, I'll leave a link to the documentation on the school page in this video. So what's the mistake here? Well, not many people are aware of the fact that object level sharing only exists in the data warehouse or SQL endpoint of a lake house. But using Spark, these object level permissions are not really respected. It's all or nothing. So if we go back to this diagram that we looked at before, we remember that a viewer in a workspace can only access the SQL endpoint of a lake house. And so if you share at an object level with a viewer in a workspace, the object level permissions will be respected. But as soon as you give them contributor or above, they will be able to access the lake house tables using Spark. And these object level permissions will mean nothing. So that's something to be careful of. Next up is number seven. And in a fabric world, it's possible or even likely that you'll be conducting workloads across different workspaces, meaning that you might be planning on reading data in one workspace, doing some cleaning or transformation, and then saving it in another workspace. Now, this is where the final mistake is sometimes made in planning out your workspace design, because people fail to understand the limitations of some of the fabric items to perform across different workspaces. And I'm talking specifically about the data pipeline. So with the data pipeline copy activity, you can only set a source and destination for data stores in the same workspace as your data pipeline. That means you can't use a data pipeline to orchestrate the movement of data between workspaces. Now you can use a notebook or a data flow to perform cross workspace reading and writing. So that is possible. And it's a similar story for the stored procedure activity in a data pipeline. Your data pipeline must be in the same workspace as 
the data warehouse that contains the stored procedure that you're trying to trigger with it. And it's the same with invoke pipeline. Both the parent and the child pipelines must be in the same workspace. So this is something to bear in mind. And for this feature and some of the other features that I believe are missing from Fabric currently, I've added ideas to the ideas portal of Microsoft Fabric. So if you want to follow the link and vote for these ideas to get them introduced to Fabric, that would be awesome too. So now you've got your Fabric environment set up for success. The next thing you need to consider in your transition from Power BI to Fabric is how you'll be getting data into Fabric. Will you be using data ingestion, database mirroring, or Fabric shortcuts? That's what I'll be covering in the next video in this series.